Okay, today we uh, consider uh, solving the linear program problem. So recall that the linear program is written, the standard form of a, li of a linear program is written as a uh, minimization problem where the objective function is linear in x, so it's a c times x, and the constraints are a linear constraint, ax equals to b, and uh, a inequality constraint, uh, x greater than equal to zero. So here, the c is a given vector with the same dimension as x. Uh, the a is a given matrix, b is a given vector, and I will assume that the number of rows of a is less than is uh, is fewer than the number of columns of a. So the a looks like this. Uh, x looks like uh, looks like this, and then the b looks like a uh, a short vector. Okay, so a is m by n. M is smaller than or equal to n. Uh, this last one means that x uh, is a positive or non-negative vector. Uh, every component of x is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so we said that this is a standard form of a linear program. Uh, Many other forms of linear program can be converted into a standard form, as we introduced last time. Okay, so uh, first, before we consider solving a linear program like this, we consider uh, the geometric interpretation of this linear program. So what this problem is actually about, uh, we first look at the constraints. We want to find an x that at least satisfies these two conditions, uh, we generalize this slightly to consider a inequality constraint for this, but the equality constraint of this is very similar. So consider that the feasible the constraints here gives us a feasible direction or feasible set, which means where the x can be com uh, can come from. And this x, this feasible set omega, is the set of points where a x is less than or equal to b, as we said. Uh, we have ax equals to b above, but let's consider a slightly more general case where ax is less than or equal to b and x is greater than or equal to zero. We know that this can be converted into uh, the standard form above by adding a slack variable. We can add a y here and then also make a y bigger than or equal to zero. And then this ax plus y will be equal to b. Okay? So we convert this one into the standard form, which is ax plus y equals to b, then x and y both are greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so this is just a, uh, then we can convert this into the standard form. So let's consider the general form here. Okay, um, so what this one actually tells us, the ax less than or equal to b means that, uh, let's say that a has n rows, m rows, is that a is, a matrix with m rows and n columns. X is the n-dimensional vector, which is column vector. B is an m-dimensional vector. Okay, and uh, this A, if we, if I write the rows of this matrix A as A1 transpose, A2 transpose all the way to AM transpose. So there are m rows of this A. Okay, so that's the A here. Uh, so each of these AIs has the same dimension as X. Okay, they are all n-dimensional vectors, and I put them as rows, so there are M of them. And then we have this X, which is here. This is my X. And then this is my B. So if I want less than or equal to B, then it would be this. Less than or equal to B. Okay. And B actually is, as I said, it's B1 through Bm. So it's M dimensional vector. Okay, so I can rewrite this as this is A1 transpose X less than or equal to B1 all the way to Am transpose X less than or equal to Bm. And remember that now each one of them, this is the scalar, this is scalar, so you can compare there, uh, so this is actually the inequality between two scalars. 
also this is scalar, this is scalar. Okay, so I just, I'm just I just have m of this inequalities. So the first inequality here uh, is actually a half space. The reason is this a one transpose x equals to b itself gives us a uh, hyperplane, right? Uh, recall that if x is uh, say if x is n-dimensional, and let's say I have this a vector, x vector, they're all n-dimensional vectors, and the b is a scalar. Then uh, the a x a transpose x equals to b. It's the same as a one x one plus a two x two all the way to a n x n. It's equal to b. Okay, this is a formula for a hyperplane. Right, the normal direction is the direction of a, and uh, it uh, and uh, uh, it um, is shifted out of the origin, and uh, is described by the b. Uh, the other way is that if you know some point on the uh, on a plane, and then this a transpose again a is the normal direction of this hyperplane. If you know there's some point, I call it say x hat, and uh, I can move this and then set this to zero. And this what this means is I have uh, a plan. <coughs> so say so this is living in a high dimensional Euclidean space. So this point here. Is where the x hat is. So we have this. This is the origin. This is the x hat. It tells me the point. And then the normal direction, this normal direction is the a direction. So this tells that all the points uh, on this plane. So say this is the another point on the plane, and I call this one x. So x minus x hat. Is this vector, and it's perpendicular to a. Okay, it's so x minus hat. X hat is a plane on the is a, a vector on the plane, and it's a perpendicular to the normal direction a. Okay, and the inner product of them it will be zero. Okay, so this a is the normal direction of the plane. So when you see that the a transpose x equals to b, it tells you for some vector a and the a scalar b, that means this is a, this is the hyperplane. Okay. So that is a hyperplane, and uh, that's equal. And if it's less than equal, that means it's on one side of the hyperplane, okay, including the plane itself. So depending on where this A is pointing to, it tells you which direction, uh, uh, which side of the hyperplane is. So for example, if this is the case, then greater than equal to A will be uh, all this, the half space on one side of this hyperplane. Okay, you just imagine that you have n-dimensional space. You use this plane to cut it into half, uh, two halves, and uh, this is one half of that. Okay, so if that's if uh, that's the case where um, the inner product is greater than than equal to, uh, sorry, it's, if that's greater than equal to b, less than equal to b, it's just this side. Okay, so in other words, you can see if you can have a transpose x minus x hat less than equal to zero means that if this is the a, then the x minus x hat should be uh, on the upside direction, upside uh, half space of this a. So you should be on this lower side, uh, lower half of this plane. Because in that case, if you have some vector x, say I have x, or, uh, x, uh, x vector here, which is on this side, uh, on the lower side of this plane, then uh, x, x minus x hat will be this vector, which is pointing to the, uh, so a uh, is to pointing to this side of this plane, and uh, this x minus x hat will be pointing to the other side. Although it's not perpendicular to the plane, but it's the other side, so the angle between them is greater than 90 degrees, that's why this is less than equal to zero, okay? And then you can move around. Uh, you can 
you know, multiply a transpose and then x hat, then this one becomes just a transpose x less than equal to a transpose hat. But this one it will be the b. Okay, so that's just for one of them, one of these inequality constraints, it would just mean a half space. Now, um, your x must satisfy all these inequality constraints. So that means one of them gives us a half space, for example, this side, and then the other one, second one, will give me another one, and I require it to be on this side. And maybe the next one will give me this, and ask me to be on this side. So you can see that we have more and more of these inequalities, you get more and more intersection of half spaces, and you will get a polyhedron. Okay, so that's why uh, what I said here is that you have this as your half space, for just one of these inequalities. And then if you combine all those m inequalities, you're just taking intersection of m half spaces. And then this becomes a polyhedral. Okay? And this is also a half polyhedral. Apparently, if you have, for example, you have two, you have two dimension space, just means this side. Okay? So for example, if I have x1, x2, and I, uh, this two gives you this is the first inequality constraint, this is the second inequality constraint, and ask you to be, for example, uh, on this side of this. Uh, but you have additional requirement that x needs to be non-negative, so that can only be this area, only the in the positive uh, <coughs> quadrant. So that's uh, just taking intersection of another polyhedral, and you finally get a polyhedral. Okay, so what these things are uh, asking for is just a polyhedral. So the feasible set itself is a polyhedral. All right, so that's the case where it's less than equal to B. But if it's equal to B, that means we're taking intersection of hyperplanes and then take this uh, intersection of a hyperplane as a set and then take the intersection of this, uh, this intersection take the intersection of this and then the polyhedra, which will still get a polyhedra. Okay, so that is the case where this is equal to zero, uh, equal to b. So in any case, we will, this constraint here is just giving us a kind of polyhedra uh, provided or constrained by those half spaces or uh, hyperplanes or, or, or polyhedras. So in the end, we get a polyhedra. Okay, so that is with the constraint. Now, what is the objective function? The objective function is also a linear function in X. So it's linear means that it's just a hyperplane uh, with some direction, okay? And we removed the, uh, the constant because if you have something like uh, plus D here, it doesn't matter because this minimizer does not change if you shift the objective function by some constant. Now, uh, as Recall that I'm just drawing a picture to give you the idea. Say, for example, if my uh, x has two components, x1 and x2, and uh, the constraints that I have is a polyhedral, as I just mentioned. It could be something like this. So it's living on this uh, space of x1, x2. So this is my omega. Okay. So this one here together means that x is in omega. So this is what the omega actually is, just requiring my x to be uh, in satisfy, requires my x to satisfy those conditions. Okay, so this is my omega. So as, as I said, the uh, the objective function is a linear function in x, so it will be also a plane. Okay, so it's supposed to be also a plane, and also uh, this passing through the origin, but doesn't matter. But that doesn't matter, as we said, you can just shift the uh, uh, objective function by a constant. So let's say that there is a plane uh, that is living in the, in the three-dimensional space because it's telling, uh, the, telling you the function value of this uh, for every point of x1, x2. Okay, and uh, uh, originally if you only have this hyperplane, which is denoted by C transpose x equals zero, this is a hyperplane. If you just look at this, then you can minimize this whatever you want because C transpose X, you can just minimize, right? You can just uh, try to minimize this function. You can get negative infinity. But the point right now is that 
the x cannot be any point. It can have to be inside this set. Okay, and that means if I have the hyperplane, I have I can only look at the value of this hyperplane above this uh, polyhedral. So that means I probably just have this plane. Uh, So let me draw this in a better way. It's probably this. So drawings. So it could be like this. So imagine that the plan I just uh, drew, I drew, I drew earlier. I'm just uh, looking at the part of this plan. When I project that part of the uh, hyperplane onto the space of x1, x2, I get this omega. Okay, so that's the what this plan is. So now you can see that I cannot make this x uh, going to anywhere. Uh, Eventually, you can go to this side and make the function value arbitrarily small. Instead, I have to constrain my x into over this uh, this omega. And in that case, this point looks like the smallest point or minimum point. So this is where the uh, the optimal solution x star is. And this the height of this point of this point is the uh, function op optimal function value, and it is lower than any other. Uh, function value of any other points uh, if we constrain ourselves onto this omega okay so now you can think that the uh, linear program is nothing but looking for uh, but looking for the optimal solution of a hyperplane or minimum value of the hyperplane over a polyhedral so I'm looking for the minimum value of this hyperplane uh, over this polyhedral Okay, that's essentially what the linear program is doing. Okay, and the very typical, uh, you can definitely imagine that the optimal solution will be attained at one of those vertices. This vertex is of course leading to the vertices here. Okay, uh, and you could get to that the entire side will be the minimum value. That's also okay. But if you this side is uh, they are all minimum. Uh, they're all optimal solutions, then at least these two endpoints are optimal solutions as well. So, uh, uh, after all, you must be able to find the minimum optimal solution at one of those, at least one of those uh, vertices. Okay, the so solutions must be at one of them, at least one of them. So, what I just said is that you could have a unique solution, which is what I draw here. And if this is completely flat, so it's parallel to this. And uh, in this case, this whole side will all be the optimal solutions. And uh, in this case, uh, the vertices of these two vertices are still optimal solution. Okay. So the uh, this gives us a very uh, strong inspiration that the we should be looking for the uh, vertices of this omega. So where the function attains the minimum value, and that must be your solution, okay? Okay, so uh, this comes out, uh, this in part inspires the first uh, method that we're going to discuss uh, in this chapter. That is called the simplex method. So the idea is, as I said, just looking for the vertex that has the minimum function value among all the vertices. Okay, um, so before that, we first recall some basic uh, concepts in linear algebra uh, because this involves the linear algebra, algebra uh, ax equals to b. It's a linear system, and uh, the solution of this x relies heavily on the uh, structure of this matrix A. Uh, so we first recall that the basic solution of a linear system ax equals to b is, is this. Consider that A is a uh, matrix, as we said. It's a kind of short and fat matrix. It's M rows and N columns. Okay, and uh, um, 
the rank of this matrix A can be uh, as large as M, right? The number of rows. Okay. We consider the case where A is de uh, non-degenerate, means that the A actually has M rows. Uh, uh, the rank of A is actually M. And in this case, uh, let's say that assume that the A can be separated into two parts. This is square part, which I call it B. This is the whole matrix is A. And this is the, the rest, which is called D. And if A is, has M rows and N columns, and this M, this, uh, this B here is M by M, is M by M square matrix. Okay, so this is M and minus M. So B is an M by M square matrix. Um, if B is a full rank matrix, or B is invertible matrix, then B must have a rank of M. And also, um, when X is called, when we denote X B as this B merge times the, the vector B, then we call this vector X a basic solution. So what I'm saying here is, imagine that your A can be written as this B and D. And this B and D are just as I wrote earlier. It's a B is a square matrix, D is a, the rest. And then consider that the AX equals to B. And this is nothing but just a, it's equivalent to that the B D times X equals to B. Okay? So now uh, if I multiply, if B is invertible, then I can multiply both sides by B inverse. The B inverse times the B D X equals to B inverse times B. Remember that B is a square M by M square matrix. So the B inverse is also an M by M square matrix. So what this one here, what this one actually is, is multiplying this B inverse to this matrix, which has the B here and D here. So when you multiply them together, you can see that you're just multiplying B inverse to B and then B inverse to D. Okay, and this tells us that this is just a identity matrix and the B inverse times D, X, and this is equal to B inverse times B. Okay, so now if this X here is this X, B, and zero, where this X, B is just this B inverse, now let me just write it out. Okay, uh, and the x is this b inverse times b, 0. Okay, so remember that this is a m by m square matrix. This is a m by n minus m uh, matrix. This is a vector, m dimensional vector. This is the n dimensional uh, vector. And if this n dimensional vector has two parts. The first uh, M components is just the B, it's just this, which is the same as this. The rest will be zero. Then apparently this X will solve this system. Because when you plug in this X here, you, you just have identity times this, plus this times zero. And that just becomes I times this. And that is the right hand side. Okay, so we call this X a basic solution. And then we give a name to this uh, portion of this X. We call it the, the X capital B here. Okay, so this capital B here is just this thing. Right? It's an M dimensional vector. All right, so this is called the basic solution to the system, to the linear system. We haven't considered the inequality constraint or the objective function yet. We just look at the linear equation or linear system uh, in the constraint. Uh, we define the basic solution. And then uh, before we continue, we need to uh, give several names or several definitions. So uh, when we refer to them, we you know what they actually means. So this XB, uh, which is 
this one here is m dimensional vector. Uh, it's called the basic variables. Okay, they just uh, they are just the uh, m components of the n dimensional vector. In the that's the basic variables. Uh, if this x b has uh, zero components, then we call this x degenerate. The degenerate basic solution. That means um, x is n dimensional vector, as we said. Uh, x b is the first is the m components as that are corresponding to the uh, the b part of the matrix A. Okay, and uh, if any one of those any one uh, of the components here is uh, zero, then we call this x degenerate. Otherwise, we call it non-degenerate. If all of those x b's are uh, non-zero, all the components of x b are non-zero, then we call x uh, non-degenerate basic solution. Okay, um, the b uh, this is important. The b is called the basic columns of a. Uh, basically, that means that A has n columns in total, uh, and the, the B uh, contains m columns, and uh, they form a linear independent, linearly independent uh, the set, or linearly independent columns. And we can use these vectors in B to represent any vectors in A. Okay, so A is this. This is the part B. This is the D part. I said that if the b is invertible, then it can be used to represent any vector here, right? So that's the, the in this case b is called a basic the basic columns. Um, and as we as we know that uh, if there are n columns in total here, and there are uh, the 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 rank of this matrix A is m, then uh, I can pick up any m. Uh, linear independent vectors, or uh, linear independent columns, there to form these basic columns. So there are not just there is no may not be unique way to uh, to find those columns, and in general it could be many of them uh, to choose many of those columns. Uh, based, many ways to choose those basic columns. Okay, just keep this in mind. Um, X is called a feasible point if it is inside the omega. It satisfies all the constraints. Okay, it satisfies this and this. And then we call X a basic feasible, feasible point. If X is a basic solution, means that it has M um, has at the most M non-zeros. All the other N minus M are zeros. X we saw earlier. This this kind of X is called a basic solution. So it is solves. It has at least n minus m uh, zeros, and at the same time, it is feasible means that it's also in this set. Okay, so that means is a has most of this components of x is zero. Uh, there are zero. Okay, only uh, at the most m of them can be non-zero, and at the same time it satisfies all of them, all the, all of those uh, constraints. Then x is called a uh, basic feasible point, and the x star is called a optimal uh, solution. If uh, it's up to the function value is smaller than or equal to it's the smallest one compared to all the points in, in X. So X star is feasible and it's better than any this function value is better than or low, uh, smaller than or equal to any other uh, objective function value. Uh, so that's called the uh, optimal feasible point or optimal feasible solution. Okay, um, now we recall several uh, or two of the uh, basic properties of uh, basic solutions. This theorem below describes the uh, property of a linear program. It's called the fundamental theorem of a linear program. So what it says is if the uh, omega of the linear program, omega is a feasible set, uh, it's not empty, so as we drew earlier. So this set, if this set is not empty, uh, by using these constraints here, we do can find some not empty set. Then um, the two statements below holds. First, the uh, basic feasible point must exist. Uh, 
they will, we must be able to find a basic feasible point. It means that uh, we, be, we will be able to find a point that looks like this uh, with uh, at least uh, n minus m zeros. Uh, could, the zeros may not be just here, maybe m were in this vector, but there are at least uh, uh, n minus m zeros. Uh, at the same time, this x is in omega. It's in the satisfies the both all the constraints. Okay, so that's the first claim. The second claim is that if this linear program has a solution, then uh, there exists at least one optimal basic feasible solution. That means we can, if it has a solution, then we must be able to find a, a basic feasible point, and that basic feasible point is also an optimal solution, like, like this one. Okay, so it is a basic optimal, a basic feasible point, but it's also more optimal. Okay, we must be able to find this. So this just tells us that, um, in, in summary, what this tells us is that if, as long as the RP has a solution, then we must be able to find a base, optimal basic feasible solution. And what this tells us, before we prove it, what this tells us is that if you know the, the optimal, if the RP is set up correctly, and then it has a solution, then by using, by look, searching for, uh, by searching over the uh, vertices of the domain omega, we must be able to find an optimal solution. Okay, so this is what the second item is telling us. Okay, so now let's consider how to prove this too. So to prove the first one, we first need to show uh, remember that the claim is we need to show that a basic feasible point exists. So what that means is we need to find some x that uh, has at, at most n minus at least n minus m zeros, and it also is inside omega. Okay. So to prove this, let's pick up any point x in the omega. Okay? Since omega is non-empty, as in the assumption, the, uh, it has a non-empty feasible set omega, so we can find at least one point from the omega. And uh, uh, since x is the omega, that means x satisfies the equality constraints and also this inequality constraints. Okay? So without loss of generality, let's assume that uh, the first p components of x are uh, non-zeros. Are, uh, are sorry, are yeah, are non-zeros, and the rest are zeros. Because x has to be greater than or equal to zero, so if it's non-zero, then it has to be positive. Okay, so uh, let's assume that the first p of them are positive. So this, why we said this is the result of loss of generality is because we can always. Uh, exchange the order of the components in x so we can see that originally i have x1 x equals to this vector x equals to x1 x2 x3 i can shift them to be to be say x2 x3 x1 okay i can do this uh, if i do this and i need to change the c accordingly the c vector in the objective function I also need to change the, the columns, order of the columns in the matrix A. I don't need to change anything for B, but uh, A, I need to move the last two columns to the, uh, as to the first two columns, and the first column to the last one. Right? By doing this, I will get the equivalent linear program. And in this case, uh, the, all the non-zeros of X will become uh, the first two. So that's the case where say uh, this x1 is 0. If we start it from, from some vector x, and the first component is 0, and the second two components are greater than 0, then I, sh I can do this shifting uh, of, the, of the coordinates, and also the shifting of the coordinates of C and the columns of A, and I can get an equivalent problem. Okay, So that doesn't change the problem itself, but I do have all the non-zero components of x as the first components in the vector. Right, so that's why. <clears throat> right, uh, I can assume that 
the first p components of x are positive, and the rest, the rest are zero. Okay, so x satisfies the uh, equality constraint. That means when I multiply a to x, I will get b. But recall that the x is a long vector, but only the first p components are non-zero. So all the others are zeros. So uh, the ax becomes the we know that a times x is a linear combination of the columns of a using the uh, components of x as the coefficients. But right now, only the first p components of x are non-zeros. So that's why the ax is just a linear combination of the first p columns of the matrix A. And uh, this x1 through xp are the non-zero uh, components of x. This A itself, as we said, it has n col columns in total, then we have this x vector x1, x2, xp, and then the others are zero. We multiply this vector to this matrix, then uh, only the first p uh, stay, right? Only the first p component uh, vectors stay. <laughs> okay, and that means this is already equal to b. Okay, so now there are two scenarios. Uh, first scenario is that the a1 through ap they are linearly independent. So if they are linearly independent, remember that each one of them is m-dimensional vector because the A has m rows, n columns. So each one of these vectors uh, is m-dimensional. Okay, and they are linearly independent means that P must be less than or equal to m. Okay, if P is less than or equal to m, then remember that X has, let me do right here, X1, through so xp, and then xp plus 1 through xn. Okay, if p is less than or equal to m, then, as I said, I, these are only, there are positive numbers, so all the rest are zeros. But there are, uh, here their p is less than or equal to m, that means the rest will be zero, and the number of zeros here will be bigger than or equal to n minus m. And that is already a basic point, a basic solution, as we said, right? It has at least n minus m zeros. And in this case, uh, since x also satisfies the, both of the constraints, and it is a basic point, so that means this is a basic feasible point. Okay, it's not, it's not just a feasible, but also basic. Okay, so that's the case where all these vectors are linear independent. Uh, but what if they are linearly de dependent? Uh, if they are linearly dependent, that means we can find a, a linear, non-zero linear combination of them. Uh, what I mean by that is that we, uh, we can find a linear combination of them, we get zero, but the coefficients are non-zeros. Right? That is equivalent to saying that these are linearly independent. So let's say that this y1 through so yp are... Uh, P of this non-zero, P of these numbers, which are not all zeros, such that the linear combination of this A1 through AP uh, using this Y1 through YP as coefficients will give us a zero. Okay, so the linear combination of them is equal to zero. So we know that this can be written as this A times Y, where this Y compo uh, has this first P components as Y1 through YP, the others are zero. Okay, so when you multiply this a and this y, you will just have this linear combination of x1 through a1 through ap, which are the first p components of p columns of a, and this y1 through yp as coefficients, and this y1 through yp are the first p components of y. Okay, and uh, uh, also we assume that this uh, this y1 through yp is at least one of them as positive. The reason is if they are all negative, if they are all negative, uh, if they are all uh, negative, then we can put a negative sign of this y. We, put we use negative y instead. We have negative y1 through negative yp. Then these numbers will be greater than or equal to zero. And then we said that this p they are not all zeros. So at least one of them should be non-zero. Okay, so we can assume that at least one of them is positive, as we said, otherwise we just take this.
Okay, so now we have two uh, two equations. First equation is this, ax equals to b. Second equation is that ay equals zero. Okay, so now I can multiply this one by epsilon, where epsilon is a positive number, or at least a negative number. And then I can multiply this epsilon on this side as well, on this side as well. And then I sub subtract it from the ax minus equals to b. Okay, so that means I need to subtract, I need to uh, use x1 minus epsilon times y1, and then x2 minus epsilon y2, all the way to xp minus epsilon yp. And the, on the right hand side, it doesn't change because it's b minus epsilon times 0, which is still b. Okay, so I'll get a times x minus epsilon y equals to b for any non-negative epsilon. So this epsilon is greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that means uh, if this linear, this columns of, uh, this p columns of matrix A are linearly de dependent, then I can find some y like this, such that the vector y formed by this uh, components y's uh, has this property, the a times x minus epsilon, uh, epsilon y is still equal to b. Okay, for any epsilon greater than or equal to zero. So, so actually it can be any, this epsilon can be any zero, any number. It doesn't have to be greater than or equal to zero, because this is always true, but I'm going to look for the epsilon that is greater than or equal to zero. And that is also one reason why I want these things to be, uh, at least one of them to be positive, so that when I subtract epsilon y, uh, I need to be careful because when epsilon go, grows from zero to positive uh, infinity, or at, up to some point, this x minus uh, epsilon y will be will not be feasible anymore. Okay, uh, because you become uh, not all the components will be positive. So you see that from the next slide. Okay. So uh, this is what I was talking about. Remember that you have this x1 minus epsilon y. So this is the a times x minus epsilon y. So I use, I don't know these vectors. So that's actually uh, x1 minus epsilon y1 times a1 vector plus x2 epsilon y2 times a2 vector all the way to xp minus epsilon yp a p vector. I know that this is equal to b vector. Okay, remember that uh, after doing this change and change the x to x minus epsilon y is still uh, satisfies ax equals to b, right? This, this is my new x. So this is my new x. It still satisfies ax to b, but I still want this x to be greater than zero. That means this, these things, they need to be, they still need to be, need to be non-negative. It should be greater than equal to zero. But remember that if at least one of these y's uh, is greater than zero, then I want to subtract them, subtract them, subtract them by epsilon times the corresponding component, uh, they would start to decrease. For example, if y1 is greater than 0, if y1 is greater than 0, epsilon is greater than or equal to 0, then although initially x1 is greater than or equal to 0, but by subtracting uh, this epsilon y1, which is a positive number, and when epsilon is growing from 0 to positive infinity, this will become smaller and smaller, right? Compared to x1, it's getting smaller and smaller as epsilon goes to, uh, gets larger and larger. And eventually, this will touch zero. This will become zero, right? It will decrease from x1 to zero. I will touch, uh, touch zero at some point. And there are p of them. So one of them will touch zero first. Uh, maybe two of them will touch zero, or multiple of them touch zero first, but I don't care. At least one of them will be touching zero first, before any, uh, um, and let's just say that uh, any one of them that touches zero first uh, 
I will consider the corresponding epsilon as the choice of my epsilon now. So this epsilon is determined by the minimum value of xi minus y, where y is greater than zero. As I said, if you have all those y ones, y twos, y p, let's say that y one, y two, they are positive. Then uh, by when epsilon is zero, then it's still x one, x two. But when when epsilon grows from zero to positive infinity, these two numbers start to decrease. This goes from x one going down from x one. This going down from x two. And one of them will go to zero first. Okay, uh, that depends on value of y one and y two. So which, how they become zero? So for this one to become zero, then epsilon needs to be to be equal to x one minus y one, uh, x one over y one. And here for this one to become zero, this should be epsilon should be x two over y two. Okay, then I will need to compare. I need to compare x1 over y1 and x2 over y2. Whichever is a smaller, which one will get to zero first, right? So that's why I'm choosing the minimum of them. If there are multiple of these choices, I just choose any one of them because that will just make a multiple of them become zero instead of just one of them become zero. Okay, it doesn't really matter. It's just looking for the minimum of these ratios. Minimum of those ratios. Okay, so as long as choose my epsilon to be this number, which is non-negative, as you can see, this y y is greater than zero, and x i is greater than equal to zero. So uh, this epsilon is greater than equal to zero, and uh, in this case, this x minus epsilon y will still be a, a feasible point. Reason is, as I said, is a times this vector is still equal to b. And all the components of this are still greater than or equal to zero. Okay, uh, but it has one fewer uh, non-zero components now because when we decrease epsilon, we choose epsilon to be uh, to be the minimum of this. Then at least one of them will touch zero, will become zero, right? And that makes this x minus y epsilon y uh, have one more zero. Okay, initially, initially the, the xp1 through uh, xn, they're all zeros. And similarly, the uh, yp1, p plus 1 the y, through yn, they're all zeros as well. But now, by subtracting uh, the x1 through xp by uh, epsilon y1 through epsilon yp corresponding, we'll get one of them as zero. And then the x minus epsilon y will have one more zero, right? Uh, in this case, you have p minus one non-zero components compared to x, which has p non-zero components. Now, this x minus epsilon y, is, as we said, is feasible, and it has uh, p minus one positive components. Then we can repeat the procedure as we did, and just keep reducing uh, the uh, the number of columns involved, the number of columns in a involved in the a x equals to b. And eventually we'll reach to a point that uh, the remaining vectors or remaining columns of the matrix A become linearly independent. Okay, as long as it's linearly dependent, we can reduce them. We can consider we can use uh, fewer columns, and eventually we we'll reach to the point uh, where all the columns involved <coughs> are are, um, are linearly independent, linearly independent. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, that's what uh, we, we just arrived. Okay, so repeat this procedure until the uh, columns of A corresponding to, the, corresponding to the solution, basic solution, and we said in this case, the columns uh, are called basic columns. If they become linearly independent, then uh, uh, and then we can re we reduce ourselves to the first scenario here, and then we reach to a basic feasible point. Okay, so that's the first part of the proof. The second part of the proof uh, is this one. So we said is this one. Uh, we said that if the the linear program has a solution, then we must be able to find an optimal basic feasible point. So it's not just a basic feasible, as we said, 
but also optimal. All right, so let's see why that's true. Okay, to show this uh, again, let's say that X is a optimal solution, not necessarily basic feasible, but it's optimal. Okay, because we know that it has a solution, and let's say X is one of those uh, optimal solutions. And again, uh, let's assume that the first P components are greater than zero. Okay, because X is greater than or equal to zero. So let's say that the first P of them, P of this uh, P components of X are actually positive. So again, uh, using the same logic as before, if uh, the A1 through AP, they are the corresponding basic columns. If they are uh, linear independent, then we know that P must be less than or equal to M. And that means my vector X has at most M non-zeros, or the address is zero. At the same time, X is inside omega, means that it's feasible. And uh, it has uh, at most M non-zero vectors, which means it's a basic solution. It's a basic point. So it's a basic point. It is uh, a feasible point. At the same time, it's optimal, so that is the optimal basic feasible point that we're looking for. Okay, it's already the base, optimal basic feasible point that we're looking for, so that we're done. Uh, but if X has this at P components are positive, but the corresponding columns are not linearly dependent, then what happens? We're going to use the same logic as before to uh, get fewer columns out of this. Okay, you limit the sum of the columns. So uh, to this point, uh, we can, again, since they are linear independent, we know that there are uh, non-zero, there are uh, P uh, scalars, which are not all zeros, such that the linear combination of this A1 through AP is zero, using this Y1 through YP as coefficients. Okay, so that means this is true. Okay, so now let's, let's consider the uh, the case where y when we multiply c to y, where this y is again, this y is again this y one through y p, and then zeros. Okay, so the first p of them is. Uh, uh, there are the corresponding y1 through yp, and the, the remainder of them will be n minus p. They will be zeros. Okay? Now, um, uh, let's multiply c and y. Take an inner product of c and y. Um, if it is non-zero, so if it is non-zero, then what do we do? If it's non-zero, then let's say that without loss of generality, let's again say that uh, it is greater than zero because if it's not less than zero, then we just take a negative y instead of, instead of y. Okay, so if c y is uh, uh, positive, let's say the c y is positive, then uh, we can again choose the epsilon to be any number between the minimum number of x i over y i. So it's uh, it's greater than zero but it's less than equal to the minimum value of these ratios. So what are these ratios? Remember that y1 through yp, uh, consider any one of them that is non-zero. I'm just dividing that scalar. So it's, for example, y1 is non-zero. I would take the ratio of x1 and y1. We'll keep it. And I would take the xi over y for all the non-zero y's. And then uh, the smallest one of them, I call it an epsilon. Okay, the epsilon will be less than or equal to minimum of them. Okay, so now what happens is that if I subtract x by epsilon y, if I subtract x by epsilon y, then, see here, as you can see, because the epsilon is chosen very small, so that if I have this vector x on Julie, x1 through xp, and then xp plus 1, which are zeros. Let me just write them as zeros. So when I subtract uh, 
x uh, epsilon y from x then I'm just subtracting I'm just doing x1 minus epsilon y1 through xp minus epsilon yp okay uh, but I'm choosing my epsilon to be so small so that we will subtract x1 uh, epsilon y1 through x1 this will still be a positive number because epsilon there is a very small epsilon multiplied to this there's small epsilon here so I subtract it from x1 through xp I'll still get non-negative values over here all right so now um, it, that means on one side x minus epsilon y will still be a non-negative vector and uh, a times x minus epsilon y will be a x minus epsilon times a y but a y is equal to zero so this is zero so i just have a x but a x equals to b so that means a times this will be still equal to b so that means x minus epsilon y is still a feasible point okay so it is, satisfies a linear constraint and also lin, uh, in, uh, the equality constraints and also the inequality constraints so that's why it is still a feasible point this is a feasible point, but at the same time, let's consider the objective function value of this new point. So it's just a c times this point. So that's c times x minus epsilon y. And uh, I can put this c inside. I'll take this first, and then c times this. So this will be cx minus epsilon times cy. But remember that we said that where y is chosen such that cy is greater than 0. And epsilon is greater than equal, greater than zero, as we saw. We define here, so that means we're subtracting some positive number, and that makes this value smaller. So that's why this is c times transpose x. Well, we found a new point x minus epsilon y, which is feasible. At the same time, its objective function value is smaller than c times x, and that is the contradiction to the assumption here, where x is already optimal. Okay, you, we cannot find any other feasible point that has smaller function value than x. So that's a contradiction because we found here. And that means the c transpose y cannot be 0. Oh, sorry, the cx, uh, c transpose times y cannot be non zero. So it has to be 0. Okay, so that means the y I chose here, or the y that I have here, when I multiply it by c, I take the inner product of the c and the y, I must get 0. Okay, so if c times y is still 0, then we can do the same thing as we did in part a. By, uh, by doing x minus epsilon y, I will not change the function value anyway, because we said c transpose times this will be just c transpose times x, uh, since the second term will be just giving us 0. So I, did, I, did not, I will not change the function value by... Uh, subtracting epsilon y from x so I have the freedom to choose as long as epsilon is uh, still uh, greater than or equal to 0 uh, this will be always feasible and always a uh, optimal solution and uh, then we can just choose the epsilon uh, a gradual increase epsilon up to the point that uh, the first p components of x when I subtract the epsilon times this uh, it will become zero. Okay, that means the x minus epsilon times this will have one more zero coming out. And that means I will have just a, a p minus one non zeros. At most, p minus one non zeros. So originally, we have p non zeros here. But doing this, I have at most a p minus one non zeros. And as we said, it's still feasible and still optimal. So we got a optimal basic feasible point. Uh, but uh, optimal feasible point with uh, one fewer uh, non-zero component, and then we can just keep doing this to reduce the non number of non-zero components. Will be always optimal and uh, feasible every time. So eventually, we'll reach to the point where uh, the corresponding columns, our basic columns, are the linearly independent. And in that case, we reduced back to the first case where the x must be optimal, basic, and feasible. Okay.
So this proves the second part of the uh, of the theorem. Okay. Uh, the next theorem says that uh, when we consider a uh, linear program with a non-empty uh, feasible set omega, then x is an extreme point of the omega, if and only if x is a basic feasible point. Okay, and this is actually corresponding to the picture I showed you earlier. If the omega is not empty, and uh, a basic feasible point is nothing, a basic feasible point uh, is nothing but those points, and which are just the uh, uh, vertices of this um, polyhedral, or in other words, extreme point of this polyhedral, uh, or the omega. Okay, that's uh, what this one says. So um, I will not prove this, but the idea is you can see from the picture that it's giving us the idea why that's that's true. Uh, in the um, so in theory, that means in theory you can only uh, check the basic feasible point of omega, omega, and find the one that has the optimal function value. Okay, that's corresponding to that is corresponding to the case I draw here. As we said, we just look for. Instead of looking for any points in here, we just look for the uh, the vertices or the extreme points of the omega, uh, and look for the one that has the smallest function value. Okay, so that's the approach uh, that we're going to take. But the, the issue here is that there there could be uh, many many uh, vertices because we're living in a very high dimensional space for a linear program. The uh, number n could be very large. The dimension of x could be very large, and uh, uh, taking the uh, when we look for the polyhedral in such a high dimensional space, there could be many many uh, extreme points or vertices, and uh, we need to it's very it will be impossible to check all of them, right? So uh, we can now do this exhaustive search or brute force brute force search of the uh, vertices of the polyhedral. Instead, we need to something. Uh, we need to some method that is uh, much smarter. Okay, um, so that's the the uh, the motivation uh, or the starting point of the simplex method. We'll be uh, working on the uh, simplex method, which has uh, the property like this. We'll Start with some vertices of the. Let's go back to the picture. We'll start with some vertices. Say, for example, uh, maybe here. So now, starting from this vertex, we'll uh, be looking for the next vertex that is uh, adjacent to it, but uh, it has smaller function value. So in this case, it will be moving to this point. Okay. And then the next situation, it will do the same. We will still look for the next uh, vertex or extreme point of the omega, but it has a smaller function value than this point, so we'll be moving to this point. Okay, and then if at this point we cannot find any other extreme point uh, of omega that has even smaller function value, then we can stop. So that's why I call it simplex method. It's moving from ver uh, vertex, uh, vertex to vertex, and that's uh, the. Uh, Rough idea of uh, simplex method.